Well, good morning, church. Here we go again, another opportunity for us to engage with one another in God's Word, to reap from the benefits of the truths that we find in its pages, and to be absolutely transformed by the power that we find within it. I'm so glad that you've decided to, to join us again this morning. Trust that our time together will be uh, helpful and beneficial for you, that you'll be encouraged, uh, and that you'll be, uh, you'll be inspired. To, to do some good, deep evaluation of yourself and to change what needs to be changed uh, that you might be more and more like Jesus each and every time you do. This morning, we uh, want to remind you just a real quick announcement before we jump into God's Word together that uh, today is the last day that we're actually taking uh, nominations for our elder and deacon boards. If you haven't done so yet, I'd strongly encourage you to uh, consider who you might nominate for those positions. They need to be members of our congregation, uh, people who fulfill the characteristics that we find in the books of First Timothy and Titus. Uh, we have uh, those mandates from Scripture of the types of men and women uh, that are qualified to lead God's family. And so uh, we would love to hear from you if you know people that you think would serve us well to give us either direction and hold us accountable to our mission on the elder board, or if you think would who would care well for our congregation, taking care of the, the spiritual and emotional needs of those that call the hub home. We'd love to hear from you on those nominations. You can do that by emailing our office or by accessing our uh, digital connections cards, either through the hub app uh, or on our website at www.hillsdaleub.org. We'd really like to hear from you as we uh, continue through the process of nominating another elder and, and several deacons for leadership at Hillsdale UB. Well, why don't we get started? As you know, we've been working uh, through a series that just uh, identifies attitudes, behaviors, uh, and, and ways of life that have no place uh, in the lives of those who would consider themselves disciples of Jesus Christ. Things that we, we need to just walk away from, that in short, we need to quit. And we've kind of been down the road of complaining, comparing ourselves to others, um, you know, all kinds of, of behaviors that or attitudes that, that are hurtful to us and certainly uh, just bring stagnation to our, our spiritual growth. Today, we're going to look at another topic. This one is, I quit destructive behaviors. No doubt, you've engaged in some behaviors in the past that you can look back and identify that that just wasn't helpful in my life. Uh, I recognize that those attitudes uh, wounded, eroded at relationships that were key uh, in, in my life or I engaged in behaviors that cut the legs out from under important relationships, maybe even your relationship with God. So today we're going to be in the book of Galatians. Paul wrote this letter to a, a group of churches in a region called Galatia. And the letter was passed around to various churches and it was useful and, and helping them kind of work through some of the issues that they were facing. And so the letter continues to be passed around churches, even today, uh, and as we open up God's word to it. Galatians chapter 5 is a section of scripture in which Paul begins to identify or address some issues in, that, that were hurting the church. Um, he was speaking to issues that were bringing about disunity in the body of Christ. So if you've been in church very long, you know that quite often there are things that happen between individuals or between groups of people within churches, sometimes between one church and another church in a town that just bring a, a sense of disunity where we, we start to, to kind of fight within ourselves, usually about things that aren't even that important, unfortunately. And so Paul is talking uh, about a number of issues that, that the church members were disagreeing on. Rules and regulations, some of them based on human tradition, some of them based on Old Testament law. <laughs> but they were talking about these things and they had serious disagreement in them. And so Paul was talking about <coughs> the fact 
that as they kind of wrestled through these things, that it was it was doing even greater damage. The issue became kind of uh, secondary to what was happening <coughs> in their relationships. In chapter 5, verse 13, Paul says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And then just a couple verses later, he says, If, if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. He said, if you continue down this path, if you continue in these practices, you're going to end up destroying one another and ultimately destroy your ability to have impact for Christ's kingdom. And then from there, Paul uh, outlines destructive behaviors and constructive behaviors. And he kind of lays them side by side so that we can see what types of practices is he talking about when he talks about destructive behaviors. And these are very helpful for us. When Paul talks about the destructive behaviors, he calls them acts of the flesh. And he gives us a list in chapter 5, verse, verses 19 to 21. Listen to what he has to say. He says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He immediately then says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and he goes on with the fruit of the Spirit. Now, today I want to focus on those destructive behaviors that Paul identifies, and as we look at them, we can, we can see that he kind of organizes these behaviors. He lists them specifically, but he organizes them into kind of five categories. They're, they're characteristics that I think if we take our time and work through the list, we can see that some of these behaviors, even if we're engaging in something that maybe isn't listed here, it might fall under the, the general category that, that Paul identifies. So let's, let's look at them together quickly. Five characteristics of some destructive behaviors that Paul sees in the first century church that I think we still see in today's church. So, first of all, he identifies that some destructive behaviors are personally promiscuous. Personally promiscuous. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Now, when we think of debauchery, a lot of times we think of drunkenness and, and overuse of alcohol. But the word that was actually used, the original Greek word that was actually used has more to do with this kind of unrestrained, um, unbridled uh, kind of filthy activity or uh, indecent activity, lustful activities or thoughts. So it goes along with the other two items listed, sexual immorality, impurity, or debauchery. It's, it's these kind of unbased, unchaste activities. It could be things that we say, uh, coarse language, joking uh, about vulgar things. It might be things that we engage in or allow into our bodies, things that we watch or listen to uh, that, that are sexually charged, uh, that arouse us sexually. could be in specific behaviors, certain types of, of dancing or, or engaging with other people that that are that have no place in our lives because they're sexually charged. Paul talks about this kind of behavior in several of his letters in the New Testament. In fact, he tells the Corinthian church that were uh, in, incredibly active in sexual immorality because of just kind of the town that they lived in. He says to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins that a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And he also wrote to the Colossian church and says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is adultery. 
So this is a, an issue that the first century church saw in Galatia, in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Colossae. It, it was rampant throughout the Roman world. Not that much different from our own. And Paul says it has no place in the church. These behaviors, he says, are against your own body. They, they personally, they are personally destructive to you. They erode at you. They eat at you from the inside out. And he tells us to have no part in them. The second type of behavior that he talks about are destructive behaviors that spiritually separate us from God. In verse 20, he identifies adultery and witchcraft specifically. You know, these behaviors that find, find a source of security or fulfillment in something apart from God. Again, Paul talks about this in other letters too to the Roman church. In chapter 1, he says, Although they knew God, they neither glorified God or gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. You see, they were trading off what God had done, places that he had revealed himself to them and traded his glory for created Objects, He said there in verse 24, Therefore God gave them over to their sinful desires, or the sinful desires of their hearts, and to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. You see, this again is a problem for the church where people began to spiritually separate themselves from God. And of all places in the church, they were spiritually separating themselves from God because of destruct, destructive behaviors like adultery and witchcraft. We do the same thing when we find our security in our jobs and our government and our finances and wealth. We set those things up as idols. And Paul says those are destructive. Thirdly, he says destructive behavior sometimes are emotionally unkind toward others. Verse 20, he goes on to say, to list hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, these, these kind of uh, active physical engagements with other people that, that are kind of clouded in anger and violence. <laughs> My wife can probably attest to tell you that I, I can get pretty worked up. I get frustrated with people. I, I talk a big game. You know, in the privacy of my home, I, I'll come home all frustrated. I'll say, man, I just want to punch him in the throat. And she knows she knows that I'm not going to do that. In fact, I've only ever been in one fight my entire life. I was 15 years old. There's a kid down the street that kept picking on my brother and sister. My parents had taught us we don't fight. We, we don't we don't repay evil for evil. And so they just always told us that we weren't to ever engage in fighting with other people. And one day again, for about the 14th time, one of my siblings came home and this kid down the street had, had knocked my sister off her bike and she was skinned up and crying. And well, mom wasn't home. So I decided to take matters into my own hand. I figured I could ask her for forgiveness later. I marched down there and, and started throwing punches and uh, trading blows with this kid. It was the only fight I've ever been in. It was a long time ago. And, you know, but I'm still drawn to it sometimes. I, internally, I, I, I get filled with, with anger and discord, fits of rage. I, I feel like I, I want to see bad things happen to some people that, that make me angry. And Paul says it's wrong. The Bible says not to repay anyone evil for evil. In Romans chapter 12, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge. I'll repay, says the Lord. You see, God calls us to live peaceably with others. These emotionally violent, angry outbursts 
unkind outbursts have no place in our lives. We've got to quit. Paul lists selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Again, these, these are behaviors, destructive behaviors against other people. This time, maybe not so outward in how they play out, but the, the, these kind of subversive behaviors, inward actions or attitudes that we have toward others, destructive behaviors that are uh, relationally divisive. Right? They erode at the fabric of relationships around us. They work quietly in conversations apart from the person that we're upset with. We seek to harm the, the credibility or the reputation of other people. We gossip about them. We call into question their character to other people. <clears throat> in Titus chapter 3, Read, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. And then look at the next, the next command. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time, and after that have nothing to do with them. Paul tells Titus, this pastor, listen, if you have people in your congregation or in your life who continually eat at relationships around them, who question other people's character, who gossip behind the scenes, who continue to eat away at those relationships. If they're divisive, warn them once, warn them a second time, and then be done with them. That sounds harsh, but if we allow those things to continue in, in our churches, then, then we find those those relationships being destroyed and and the church is not able to to be unified and in pursuing the mission of Christ. <clears throat> last uh, last behaviors that are listed. Drunkenness, orgies and the like. Now, orgies is, is kind of a bad translation. The the word that's used here is better translated riotous raucous activity. <laughs> We've seen plenty of that over the past year, haven't we? And so these behaviors, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, Paul's talking about these kind of out in the open, um, excessive behaviors that that affect the whole of our communities or our, our cultures. These behaviors in which the large crowds of people, or maybe even the small crowd groups of friends, go out in the community and they just cause destruction and public lewdness and drunkenness and. And they destroy property and go after and intimidate people. And Paul says, within the church, can't happen. Uh, I find it fascinating that, that Paul lists these acts of the flesh right next to or right before the fruit of the Spirit. And, and if we were to, to list them out, you actually see they kind of pair against each other. They, they serve as opposites, contrasting living in the flesh, destructive behavior, and the fruit of the Spirit, that which brings and gives life. The first ones listed, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, are all uh, a twisting, a distortion of the first fruit listed in the fruit of the Spirit, love. When we distort love, we get ourselves wrapped up in these other behaviors. The second two, idolatry and witchcraft, are seeking joy and peace in something from some source other than God. The opposite of patience and kindness and the fruit of the Spirit is hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, and other behaviors like those. Paul goes on. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, they are the exact opposite of the fruit of the Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness. And then the lists both finish. We're to avoid activities of drunkenness and riotous carousal and instead practice self-control. You see, these two lists that Paul gives us are, are at the end of a spectrum. On one side, we see destructive behaviors. On the other side, we see acts of uh, a spirit-filled life. We could probably all give a pretty good examination of our own lives and, and see which behaviors within them are, are destructive and, and unhealthy. But I want us to finish today with three quick thoughts. 
from a paragraph that Paul then writes just after this. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 to 10, he says, Do not be, be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary or become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Three closing thoughts. One, the Bible tells us in this passage, as in many others, that that God has laid out creation and ordered it to reproduce what is planted. If you plant corn in the ground, you get corn in the fall. If you plant a maple seed, you're going to get a maple tree. You won't get an oak or an aspen or a sycamore. You'll get it. You, you get what you plant. Our behavior is no different. If you sow acts of the flesh, you will get what you've planted. Not only does, our, does what we plant reproduce, but when it's nurtured, when it's placed in an environment where it's continually uh, watched over, protected, it not only reproduces, but it multiplies, sometimes a hundredfold. Just a few weeks ago, one of my wife's friends gave us a, a squash. Now it looks like a, a tiny little pumpkin, but, but it was a squash. It's one of these heirloom vegetables that uh, are, are kind of popular. And, and Tani told Sarah that, that the seeds for this, these squash were a dollar a piece. Uh, I gotta think, that's a pretty expensive seed. And so Tani grew about 20 of them and she gave one to us and we cooked it up and it was pretty tasty. But when Sarah prepared it, she scooped out the guts out of the middle. She washed up all the seeds, dried them really good, and, and is going to keep them in the spring. Now, that one little pumpkin will produce about 100 seeds. That's a great return. As long as we give, give care to them, watch over and protect them over the winter, and then plant them in a place where they can flourish and grow, we'll see, see those efforts multiplied. And, and we need to be careful, church, that, that we're not sowing seeds and creating an environment where acts of the flesh are, are nurtured and cared for and protected. Those things need to be weeded out of our lives. If we allow destructive behaviors to, to not only grow but, but to be protected, we're, we're setting ourselves up for incredible pain and destruction within Christ's body. It can't happen. We've got to stop destructive behaviors. The second thought comes from verse 8. Whoever sows to please their flesh will, it's a, it's a promise, will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. You see, again, it's a, it's a natural order of things. Everything that's done in the flesh, it will experience destruction. You can guarantee it. You can take it to the bank. It will destroy your interactions with others. It will erode at your ability to have influence with others. It'll destroy yourself, just as we talked about those sexual sins are sins against your own body. They're natural consequences. When we live in those ways, they are destructive behaviors. It'll destroy and erode at your relationship with God. Spiritually, physically, relationally, these behaviors bring death and destruction. There's no way around it. And then the last thought is that by eliminating destructive behavior, we are, or in order to eliminate destructive behavior, we have to commit to the hard work of doing so. It doesn't just happen. If you've ever planted a garden, you know that you can go to great care to till the soil and to fertilize it, to plant the seeds just so. 
after several weeks, what happens? Weeds pop up. And you have to give constant attention to that garden or the weeds will overtake the vegetables that you, you so desperately are trying to protect. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary or become weary doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Quitting destructive behaviors is not an easy task. It's something that we will have to continually address in our own lives personally and together as the body of Christ as we weed out destructive behaviors in the church. Address them, identify them for what they are, and quit. Let's pray together as we commit ourselves to stopping destructive behaviors in Christ's church. Father God, we're so grateful for the morning, for the opportunity uh, to come before you, to, to be honest about ourselves, be transparent about our behaviors and our attitudes. And Lord, today as we've read your word, you've helped us to identify certain behaviors that have no place in us or certainly in the, the larger body of Christ. And so God, I pray that this morning for each one of us, you would convict us, that we would be able to see in our own lives that which erodes at uh, relationships, either with others or with yourself. Or those things that, that eat away and, and tear at us and bring death and destruction in our own lives. God, and I pray that you would help us to quit. And that, that tomorrow when we wake up in a new day, that we'll be able to commit to continue our quitting of destructive behaviors. Lord, we will do it in your power, with your strength, and in continued commitment to being more and more like your son. We just ask that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us as we identify those things and as we commit to quitting. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm so glad again that you've, you've joined us this morning. If, if we've talked about something today that, that you find p- particularly poignant in your own life, if, if there are behaviors or attitudes that you've struggled with maybe for years and, and you just need to get on top of them, we'd, we'd love to come alongside and pray with you or, or connect you with a counselor in our in our church or maybe just connect you with a small group of people that are that are just trying to figure it out and get through life the same way you are if if you could use that help will you let us know on those electronic connection cards again either on the the app or through our website we'd love to talk with you maybe maybe you've been listening over the past several weeks or this morning for the first time and and you realize that that God is calling to you that he's pulling you out you've you've never turned to him you've never given your life to him but you can recognize the dysfunction in your own life and you you know that you need help to quit And to come into new life. To live out, as the Bible lists them, the fruit of the Spirit. If you'd like to pray that prayer today, it's very simple. You just confess before God that you have have rebelled against Him. That you have done that which He finds offensive. That you've sinned, as the Bible calls it. Confess that sin. Ask Him for forgiveness and commit your life to living, to please under please his son under the authority of his son. Recognize Jesus for who he has said he is and give your life to him today. If you do so, I, I would just ask that you would also let us know of that decision. Let us know through that connection card. Call our office tomorrow morning on Monday. or uh, Just let us know that God's doing a, a magnificent work in your life. We would love to come uh, on that journey with you. Look, it's, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege for us to be able to offer these online services. I hope you'll continue watching and engage in worship. Thank God for who he is and what he's done in your life as we uh, let, let some worship play uh, in the next several minutes. And just spend some time speaking with God about how wonderful and glorious he is in your life. We'll look forward to joining you again very soon next week on another time of worship and study together. Until we do, have a wonderful week. Be blessed and be a blessing. Godspeed.
my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a might I would withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou choose. Here am I, all of me. Take my life, it's all for thee. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer. Mine. Take my heart, for it's thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour, at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Here am I, all of me. Take my life, it's all for thee. Here am I, all of me. Take my life, it's all for thee. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee.